Shirley Adams to welcome you back to the Sewing Connection Series 15. I've been all over the country since last series and have brought back not only a huge reservoir of ideas from everywhere, but the actual garments borrowed right off the backs of the talented fiber artists. We'll have a whole procession of these throughout the series. Some of them you will absolutely love. Others will be interesting, but you wouldn't want to wear them because they're not your thing. This is to be expected. We all have different tastes and different needs. I'll hope to offer something for everyone and for every skill level. We'll start out in Charleston, South Carolina. This is a lovely city with charming old buildings in various stages of preservation. Contrast that with the newest thing in threads that I found in a wonderful sewing shop. Those that I have on this jacket are some that I found in the shop. And if you don't have time to do everything in a shop to see everything, which means several hours if it's a good shop, then just maybe concentrate on one aspect of it. What I looked at in this shop was the buttons and the thread. And uh, the buttons is what prompted the whole outfit. Very often I have buttons design it for me. And because on this button it looks like an explosion of uh, threads, I did the same thing on the jacket with some threads I found that seemed to go with it. But first let me tell you how this jacket came about. It's kind of unusual in that the left side comes over here in buttons and then it reverses and the right side buttons over here. Well, it's my same old standard jacket. 20 times by now probably I've made it. And where it came from, of course, is just a standard uh, patterner. And it's a big size, an oversized jacket. So what I did is increase the size of this a little bit from my measurements anyway by just loosening the knobs and moving it over slightly so that it's, oh, bigger than I am. Uh, because I wanted it that way. I want it roomy. I want room for a sweater under it. And then instead of cutting the shape out here at the side, I just cut it absolutely straight down the side so there is no shape in it. So it's just a big oversized jacket. And then what I've done to make this little funny blip here on the top is simply add. And I do this with paper. I just play with a piece of paper and see what it looks like. Maybe hold this up in front of me, in front of a mirror to see if it goes over as far as I want it to, to accommodate that button so that the button's right here to say, see, this is why I put the threads on. Well, this is what I ended up with as I played with my piece of paper. And so it just goes out right here on the left side only. Now it's more efficient to cut out both the left and right at the same time to cut out two layers, so that's what I did. And this is the, the right side that I then cut off after I had it. So this was the jacket and the facing, and that's simply the discarded piece. And uh, we'll go on from there. Well, come over to the machine and let me show you how to do this. Now all those threads that you see in the shop are just marvelous, and there has been also <coughs> an explosion of the uh, vastness, the richness of all the threads in the last uh, year or so. And uh, here are a couple of them. Now this one I thought, isn't that pretty? They aren't all the same s uh, color purples. There are various shades of dark and light purple and some grays and blacks mixed in with it. And so what I did first when I was putting this on is just sort of get a feel for where exactly I wanted those threads to be. And it seemed to me that the easiest way is to just draw a line or two, not all of them, but just a couple of lines to get a little curve going. For instance, uh, I wanted it to start on a shoulder and kind of curve around here. So let me just draw one line. And it doesn't really want to draw too well on this fabric, but it's dark enough so that I can see it. Maybe I'll get it dark enough so that you can see it. Here it goes. Okay, just one line. That'll do. And uh, then as far as what kind of a foot you need, uh, you decide whatever is going to do best for the thread. And I usually try out more than one foot on a scrap of fabric to see what's going to hold that thread the best way so that I can then zigzag over it. And I found with this one that uh, what worked best is just this uh, foot that has a little elevated place underneath. There's a little channel there and the thread goes through there. Because of all those slubs in, it didn't go through easily on uh, the cord foot or some of the other feet that uh, might hold back those slubs. So let's get it on zigzag. And I don't need it to be that wide, so I'm going to narrow it down. And I don't need it to be that close, so I'll lengthen the stitches and we'll see what this looks like. Now just don't let the thread pull anywhere. Make sure it's loose enough here that you can move it around. And uh, other than going through that foot, it really doesn't need any other precautions. 
So this is sort of a celebration. Uh, fireworks coming off this. Now I'm using not a matching thread, but a contrast so that you can see it. But you can see how easy this is to simply follow a line and just curve it around as the line curves. And if you need to stop and adjust, work with the needle down position so that every time you stop, it's down. And then I'm going to use the knee control to kind of raise so I can go around that curve more easily. And by the time you have the matching thread, and I did use a matching thread here. I did use the same purple because if I had used um, a monofilament, sometimes you get a little sparkle, a little shine from that. So I thought, and I tried both by the way, but no, it looked better if I just used the matching thread and then it didn't show up at all. Anyway, this is the idea of it. So easy enough to do. And by the time I got one done, I thought, yeah, this is what I want, but not one. Let's do several, but just that one line is all that's necessary. And if it drew a little bit, it did that because I didn't, I guess I do have interfacing under it, but it will pull out so it's not a big deal. Well, this is just the first one, and then I did more and more and more and used up most of this package of thread putting all that on. So when is it enough? Where do you want to run out of thread? Sometimes is when it's enough, but I stopped with this. Then I'm in the process of making another suit, and it's going to be in this aqua. I didn't get it finished, but I'll show you what I went through to uh, do some of this, what the thought process is. I can get a hold of it all here and bring it over for you to see it. Okay, this is a suit I'm going to make. It's going to be silk. I'll get this one out of the way down here. It's going to be a silk suit, and it's going to have these buttons on it. Uh, these big chunks of aqua ice I thought were interesting. And I wanted to use a lot of the threads that I picked up in that shop. And so I tried them out, of course, on a scrap first. Now, the threadier it gets, the more dense that thread, the more dense the stitching is. That means you're going to need some stabilizer underneath. Here I just have interfacing, but it's very likely you'll need a stabilizer there too, depending on your fabric and, and how heavy the thread is. So these I tried a lot of metallic threads and doing different decorative stitches on the machine because there's such a vast variety of stitches that seemed like a good way to go perhaps. So that was one choice. Here was another one because I found all these pretty cords that would go with this a suit and I thought well those maybe ought to be used a lot of stripes of all those cords and that was kind of nice I rather like that one too or here's another combination of cords stitched down with decorative stitches just a little filigree type stitch of uh, various metallic threads and that was kind of pretty but then I tried something that just sort of blended in just a subtle use of thread here and I decided I really like this best and so this is what I'm going to do on my suit. Just do a lot of these decorative stitches. But again, I kind of lean toward those dense designs where uh, uh, there's a lot of thread used. So the first step there is going to decide from this suit pattern. And again, I just used a plain pattern and changed it a little bit. I, what I'm going to do on this suit, you can see, because it's, uh, I have the top part of it here, I'm going to cut it off, which is right about at this level, somewhere in the midriff area somewhere above my waist I'm cutting it off and that's in order to get one buttonhole here in the seam and to get the second buttonhole I planned for it here so you have to plan that in advance I put the pattern on in the front of a mirror to see exactly where I wanted those two buttonholes and planned accordingly so that what I'm doing is I do this decorative stitching on it is uh, one row just comes down the one right at the center front but then from there on, I'm going around to allow for that buttonhole, which I'll put in later. And you have to think at what stage you do these things. Well, that buttonhole can't come along until after I have the whole suit finished, uh, because this isn't going to be a bound buttonhole. It's going to be a machine buttonhole. And I might even do that with a little decorative stitch over it then to blend in with the rest of it. So this is one that I did. And just to make sure that I don't mess up on the other side, because I want it to be the mirror image, I wrote down all my numbers that I did, all the stitch patterns, so that I'd be sure to get them in the reverse. And uh, so I've started the second side, and I'm just making sure that these come out the same. To make it easy, what I have done is just used 
the edge of the foot as a guide. And so each row is one foot's width away from the next row. And that did make it very easy. Okay, I'm going to have to get the right stitch again. And so I see that my next stitch is going to be, oh, what, number one, two, three, four, number 119. So I'll get back to the menu here because I'm going to have to advance it. It's still ordinary sewing, but I'm going to have to advance it to the number I want. And uh, here we go on this stitch, 119. And so let's see what happens here. Now this is really absorbing. It's something that's a lot of fun to do. And all I have to do as I do this stitch is make sure that the edge of the foot right here stays with the edge of the former line of stitching and guide it around as it curves the corner here. And when I get it all the way down to the buttonhole, then I'll be ready to skip over the buttonhole and continue it down below that. And again, a dense stitch. I found that because this suit fabric is quite heavy and because the interfacing I have under it is really quite heavy, that I wasn't even going to need to have any stabilizer under it. Now, if it looks like it puckers just slightly, I found it'll press out perfectly and so it's not a problem. I would stop right now, except I need a stopping point and so I'll keep on until I get to the buttonhole because it might be hard to get just exactly the right stitch back in place again when I continue it. But as soon as I get here to the buttonhole, okay, now I can just stop. And what I would then do later is just skip across it and start down here to finish it up. So very easy. Just let that machine work for you and do the pretty things that it's capable of doing. And uh, be sure you use all those. Where am I getting the thread? Yes, I am. Okay, be sure you use all those machine capabilities because it's such a waste if you don't use every one of them. Okay, so that was fun to do, but let's see what some other people have done using threads. Let's look at the models and see some of the pretties going on. Okay, the first one that you see belongs to Marion Eller of Houston, Texas. And notice that she has done a lot of piecing on that jacket. And uh, be besides all the different colors that she has in there, all the pieces, then she's outlined things or stitched through them or done various things with just a little gl a glint of metallic thread. So it's not overpowering. There's just a little bit there, but it makes such a pretty uh, accent on it, uh, on all her textured fabric. The next one there is by Polly Truk of uh, Arveda, Colorado. And uh, this is a Kelly Green, and that she has done on her serger. Don't ignore the possibility of doing some flat lock all over that serger and some of those pretty, really heavy rayon threads. And uh, you can do some wonderful things. There are a lot of novelty serger threads you really need to look into. And has Polly done a wonderful job of just crisscrossing here and there and accenting the suit to make it really outstanding? This is Grace France, and she's a retired professor from Montana State University. She's from Belgrade, Montana, and this I just absolutely adore. Uh, just look what she has done there. And with all these wonderful squares of fabric rainbowed around, you know how I am with color. And so this one is just awesome to me. And uh, it's all silk, both the uh, fabric on top and the suit itself is silk. And then she's done a lot of metallic thread. Well, look back at what I have here, and I'll show you how Grace did that. Okay, she first of all started with her suit fabric, and she uh, fused then those squares to it. And this is just various silks, just in kind of colors that flow nicely. And then she has dropped some metallic cord down on it, uh, just whatever you would like to put there. And I'm not going to change the thread, but I will change the foot. I'm going to put here, um, a foot that will move along so I can do some free motion stitching. And so I'll put it on right side up is always a very good idea. And I'm going to drop the feed dog because you don't want it to hold you in place. You want to be able to do some uh, stitching every which direction. So I'll drop that back here. And then it's just a matter of doing some stipple stitching and catching the cord as you go. And let's raise the feed dog. It's telling me it 
you can't do anything wrong. It tells you exactly what to do all the time. But what I also need to do is just go back to the menu and go to a standard straight stitch uh, so that I can do my thing. And after checking feed dog cup, press start button. Okay, but I'm not really going to do that machine. I'm really just going to push the foot pedal. It is very comforting to know that you can't do anything wrong. The machine will tell you what's what. But this is the idea. This is what she's done. She's just gone back and forth and all over, doing this curvy stitch every place so that the, both the cord is all stitched down, but also all those raw edges of the fabric are stitched down because even though they have been fused in place, it's kind of nice to go over them because this is going to get a lot of wear. And uh, Grace displays this. In fact, it's won some contests already. And because of this, it's going to get a lot of handling and you want it to be very sturdy and to be able to withstand everything it's going to take. Well, that was a fun process. Remember that. You might want to do it on something of yours. Let's look at another one on a model. And this one, now if Grace's was really colorful and if you think that, well, I don't want to wear anything that colorful, let's look at this one by Faye Palmer of Virginia Beach, Virginia. And what, Vir what uh, Faye has done is something very, very quiet and very discreet. Just look at the thread that she has in that midsection and notice how she found a thread that just perfectly matched uh, the blouse that she's wearing with it, that pumpkin blouse. And that thread being the very same color just looks wonderful on it. But notice how subtle it is. It's just one stitch pattern that she's used throughout. Just one design, not a whole lot of them. And uh, just a little subtle touch. So that might be something else you're interested in. Or here's an outfit by Janice Lippincott. She's from Blair, Nebraska. And this I saw her model down at the Quilt Festival. And here, of course, she's a quilter. She has all kinds of wonderful things. And uh, I think she named this, is it a zoo or a jungle out there? Because she has both zoo animals and jungle animals, both in the wild and in cages. So some of these were done with memory cards, those zoo animals are. And they are, uh, she used some cord to make the cage bars there. And then there are also a lot of wild animals down below, both of the fabric and some appliques on it. And then also look at what she's done to that shirt that she has with it. Now this is interesting, and if we have time we'll get back to this shirt, because notice how all over that shirt, and I'll just show you what it is, and then maybe we'll get to it, but notice how all over that shirt she has some thread stitched down like this. It's couched in place and it just meanders all over the place, just back and forth all over. And what I've done on this, I don't know how she did hers, but I did mine with a miracle stitcher, which uh, just holds the yarn in place very nicely while you then do some monofilament stitching over the top of it, zigzagging it down. And that way you can just go every direction and do some wonderful things. Well, what I'm going, doing is going through this whole package of thread and doing a lot of those different ones because they blend with this t-shirt. Now, my favorite when I do miracle stitching, my favorite is actually using mohair yarn because it catches so beautifully. And uh, yet you have to think, what is the upkeep on this garment? And because this is going to be washable, it's just going in the washer and dryer, then I can't use anything that I would have to risk shrinkage on. So I can't use my mohair yarn on this. That's dry clean only. So think about that when you add these threads. What kind of care is it going to have? And make sure that everything is compatible and that it will work to your advantage. So uh, that one was really nice. Now let's see another one that is a little bit uh, more somber maybe, a little bit quiet and subdued, but very, very interesting. Because as I said, there's something for everyone here. So let's see what the other some things are. Okay, this one is by Sharon Eisenhower, and she's from Columbus, Ohio, and she's done some really interesting things on this jacket. Now it's a black jacket, so it's very quiet. And uh, notice that what she has done on there is, uh, for one thing, she has stitched some threads down. See that green, or I mean some ribbon. See that green ribbon that she stitched down actually with a decorative stitch on her machine. And uh, then she's also done some uh, squares of fabric that are kind of Harlequin fashion in that half of them is one color and half is another color. And some of the other things that she's done on that jacket 
are, oh, stitch some cords here and there around, and, and she's done some other stitching here and there, and just used a lot of threads in various places. And also, look at her use of fabric. She's put a few patches on, and yet the whole thing, all put together, it gives a rather quiet effect. It really isn't anything that's too glaringly wearable artsy that you would feel uncomfortable in if you like quieter things. Uh, let's look here at some of the things that she has done. For one thing, she has made those squares, and here's how those squares go. You just stitch two squares together, first of all, uh, two different colors, and you stitch them diagonally right through the center, and then simply turn them so that you have half of each showing on the diagonal. And then as she put that down on the fabric, here again, probably with just free motion stitching, she stitched back and forth, and hers are in straight stitches. So as you'd put it down there, it's just stitching uh, instead of all over as a former one went. It's just going back and forth like this along the edge so that it does put the edge down, even though it's fused down. And if you want to use pretty metallic threads or something that really shows up, you can do this to your advantage. And as long as you cover all those raw edges, then it won't matter. It's going to be all safe, even though it isn't turned under, and even though it isn't satin stitched, it'll work out just beautifully. Now this also she did with metallic threads, but notice how she could have done it with whatever she wanted to. Another thing that she did that I thought was very interesting was to stitch that ribbon on. And this is something that I thought I must try because I had some ribbon that would do this very well. Now what this ribbon is, it's, uh, I had some things pinned to it to remind me what I wanted to do with it. Notice what that ribbon is. It's a see-through ribbon. It's an organza. It has kind of sparkly edges on it. And uh, not only is it see-through, but also this one's variegated. And so I thought, wouldn't this be pretty on a gray or a brown or something just to give a subtle touch? Because if you don't want much extra color and you just want the interesting effect in, this might be a good deal. Now, there are two ways that you might do this. There are many ways you might do it. There are so many ways to do everything that you're never limited to one particular thing. On this, though, she did a, a decorative stitch. And so for that, of course, you'd need the standard foot and you'd need the feed dog back up in position. And that decorative stitch then, uh, she chose some pattern. Oh, I'll just choose something back to the menu here again. And I'll choose something in the higher numbered stitches. And maybe it'll be, oh, number 136. So let's go up to there and see what that looks like on it. OK, here's 136. And not only did she get that ribbon on with the decorative stitches, <clears throat> but it's sort of pleated. It's scrunched up here and there along the way. And th this gives an interesting effect. And I'm going to take a pair of tweezers to do that so that when you start to do that stitching, did I get the feed dog up? No, I did not. So my machine tells me I didn't. And as you start to stitch this design, just every once in a while stop with the needle down position. Raise that presser foot. If you have a knee lift, so much the better. Let it go down again and stitch a little bit more with that design. And raise it again and scrunch it a little bit more. And uh, move it along a little bit more. So this is an interesting effect. I really like this. Now everything I see as I travel around, I either store it in my memory and hope I can remember it back in my sewing room when I want to get to it. Or uh, maybe sometimes I actually take a photo of it if they don't mind. And people never do. You know, they're always so pleased. Now anybody who doesn't sew, you wouldn't do these things to, but sewers understand this. And so it's very common for sewers when you're talking with them and they have something wonderful to say, oh, I must see that, and here you are handling their clothes and so on. And, you know, it's expected. In fact, it's very flattering because they're pleased that you like what they've done. And so it just doesn't make it a bit of difference. But notice how this is really easy to do. Everybody can do this as long as you can just stop now and then and then go on. And this is a nice, another nice way to get some pretty designs in. And push it on a little bit more. And uh, whatever tool you find works best. Now I even tried this by putting it through the darning foot. And that's the foot I just took off. I even tried it by putting the ribbon through this 
to see what would happen. And that held the ribbon nicely, so that's another possibility. But I finally decided, well, it's easier to just stop and move it on with the tweezers. So you really have to experiment with things like this on a scrap of fabric to see which one suits your capabilities and your equipment uh, the best to see which one you can actually do. Well, we have one more here that I want to show you, and this is from June Grieg of St. Louis, Missouri. And she is a very clever lady who does wonderfully interesting things. She teaches classes over there in the St. Louis area. And notice with this suit and the vest that's under it, uh, she has not only couched all this yarn on so heavily that it looks like a complete design on the outside, it looks like it's an applique fabric, but she also, on the vest underneath, has embroidered it by hand with the same yarn and just created a completely different effect so it looks like a complementary fabric. It doesn't even look like the same fabric anymore. So this is just a really innovative way to use some yarns, to use some threads, and uh, think about these and see if they don't apply to what you're doing. Well, you'll be left hanging by a thread until you get to a shop to see some of their newest offerings. In the meantime, I'm off to Birmingham where something really eerie happened to me. Come join me and we'll tunnel into it.